Now, question number two, I am going to give you a certain examples. Is art a window to the troubled mind? For a long, long time, we have used art as uh, as, a, as, a, as a window to try and understand uh, whether people are having difficulty. Uh, we have people have used art to imagine things. You know, you, when you read something, you have to imagine. Uh, and sometimes your responses to what you see might be evoke or might give somebody an idea of what you are suffering. Okay. Let me just go to this is a, an artist called William de Kooning. Have you, have you heard of William de Kooning? He was an abstract painter. Okay. William de Kooning developed Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And he first started by doing this kind of painting. I thought I had a better painting. Okay. He initially would draw like this. And as he developed Alzheimer's painting, his painting lost its coherence and became less complicated. And towards older life as you see, this painting becomes less and less and less coherent. Goya, Francisco Goya started off painting like this. And as he grew older, he started getting loss of vision, loss of hearing and he, he probably developed mental illness because of lead toxicity, which probably came from the lead paints, the white uh, paints that they used. Uh, and he started doing this, which was more darker and darker and darker and darker. This is a patient with a particular kind of dementia and he started off when his dementia was undetected by painting this and the doctor who was seeing him got him to paint this throughout his, uh, his illness until he died. And this is his original cartoons, which became more and more menacing. As his illness progressed, you know these were these these were his uh, his caricatures of self. Similarly, we are aware that people who have body image disturbance, uh, I'm not going to go into the neuroscience, but they perceive their body differently. Okay, Let this person, of course, you know, no and who kept throughout his career thinking of his body as more different, more different and he went and had a whole lot of surgery done. I am not going to go into the science of this because you know, but no, but basically. So, some of the things that people have done, psychologists have done have used artistic representations to try and gauge you know difficulties. And one of this is uh, this whole uh, this, this, these tests called projective tests, uh, which are still used frequently by psychologists. And there are things like the Rorschach inkblot test, uh, of course, this is a satirical uh, thing of the Rorschach inkblot test about how George Bush took a Rorschach inkblot test. And what is called a thematic aperception test, basically you show people pictures and you try and see how they interpret these pictures. Then you use things for children called draw a person test, you know and by getting the kids to draw, you make uh, assumptions about how their mental health status is. And this is again called a Rosenzweig picture frustration test. So, basically the point I am trying to make is that you can use some of these and ha these have been used to get an understanding of, uh, of your mental state. The last section that I would like to end by is art as therapeutics. Can we use art as a tool to improve or treat pathological states of brain functioning? Now, there is a growing body of scientific work that suggests that art training can improve cognitive functioning. Now, basically practice of various art forms involves different areas of the brain. And uh, 
there has been some work which showed that if you give people you show people pictures of people dancing or a, or, a, or a video of people dancing, the brain areas which are activated during this particular thing, thing of, of seeing people dancing are the same brain areas which are activated during mathematical reasoning, because they overlap strikingly with the areas which uh, occur when you are watching people dancing. So, often what happens in the arts and a lot of my artist friends do that, they want to justify teaching arts saying you know what teaching arts uh, will give people a chance to become uh, illustrators here. Now, there are much better chances of becoming illustrators in TV studios or doing this and I get very upset with them, because I tell them that you know why people should be taught, why children should be taught arts, because it makes them better mathematicians. Why should uh, people should be taught dance or music, because they will be able to uh, solve problems better, because exercising one part of the brain exercises another part of the brain, which is used for totally different activities. Okay. So, training students in arts may change the structure of their brains and the way they think and there is enough evidence for that. Putting a violin in the hands of a, a child may help him to do math better and there is emerging evidence for that. Learning to dance or paint improves a child's spatial ability to learn or to read. And there have been studies which have shown that you know teaching children music can actually improve their reading skills. Learning to engage and persist, which one has to do with art. If you take a lump of clay and you are trying to do something, it collapses and then you have to do it again and again and again teaches children persistence skills, which no amount of game playing does. Okay, so, music has been helped, has been used to help injure, uh, to, 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 to treat the injured brain, especially in people who have depression. Music has been helped in, uh, has been used to help people with Alzheimer's dementia. do not go into this, this is a very busy slide, but a group of people with dementia were taken to an art museum and these are people who could not remember what they had eaten that day. Uh, and when they were asked what did you see and the one old gentleman made a very good point. Uh, he saw Picasso and he could not name the painter, although he, he knew a lot about painting, he had forgotten all about that. He said, uh, this fellow has uh, learnt to paint uh, pain uh, in a different way, you know, which means that watching the painting made him use one part of his brain that he was not using and he interpreted the painting with the parts of his brain that were still working. You know. So, painting or watching paintings helped this group of people recruit areas of the brain, which they were not normally using. You know, the parts of the brain, which were getting demented, uh, were prevented, preventing them from using, uh, you, you know, working properly in their everyday lives, but getting them to recruit other areas of the brain, seemed to help them. Mindful art therapy, you know, it is about mindfulness. When you take a brush, as I explained earlier, you have to be mindful. And this is very useful for children who cannot be mindful, you know children who have attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder etcetera. You train them to do this and side by side what they do learn, the brain learns to sustain attention, which is very very necessary for these kids. Okay. Uh, so, which brings me to arts therapy for a whole series of people with brain and mind disorders. I am not going to go into details, but there are various art interventions, for example, role play and psychodrama, you know, and uh, sculpting. Sculpting has healing effects, because in the human brain, the hand 
has greater representation in the in, in the brain than uh, say the leg or uh, other parts of the body. So, when you use your hands to do things, you actually massage much larger areas of the brain side by side, which are used then for other things. Some people have said the theatre is the ultimate fitness product, brain fitness product. What I would like to leave you with is the thought that art can be used to rewire the brain. And this is called neuroplasticity. And it is very, very important in this group of people who are called digital natives. You know, some of you are probably digital natives yourselves. Who are the digital natives? Who grow up with technology from childhood? Who grew up with Facebook from childhood? You know, these are people where whose brains spend more and more time on technology related tasks and less time exposed to other people. So, it drifts away from the fundamental social skills of meeting other people, responding to other people. And often you will find that in today's days, day and age, there is a lot of violence that happens among young people, because they have not realized how much or how little it takes to hurt the other person. And this is classic if you look at uh, these bulletin boards and uh, things where people are always flaming each other. You know, I am shocked and surprised by the amount of violence and hatred and vitriol and acid there is in these online conversations. But you can get away with it. If you did that to another human being, you, you would have to face that person's hurt. On the internet, you do not have to. You just get flamed back. So, that makes you flame, and flame back. So, the next time you meet a, another human being, which may be two years later, uh, you have no qualms in taking a stick and poking it through. You have no qualms about taking a rod and poking it through somebody's private parts. Yeah. So, in a way, this whole digitalization that is occurring and taking away from our social skills is actually making people more and more and more violent and uh, and difficult. The effect is apparently strongest in the people who are digital natives, people in their teens and twenties who have been digitally hardwired since toddlerhood. I would like to focus on the fact that technology, while it gives us great gifts, is also creating a decline in visual imagination. It is also creating a decline in problem solving everything is on the internet. I can Google everything. So, I really do not have to do too much of thinking, because somebody has done it before. If I have to do an assignment, it is already done. You know. So, it is made life immeasurably useful, but it is made life less human. Okay. And in that sense, you know, art makes you more human. I would like to read out what Professor Susan Greenfield, who was the head of the Royal Academy, said in her speech. She said, the current teenage generation is headed for mass loss of personal identity, by spending inordinate quantities of time in the interactive virtual two dimensional cyberspace. It is as if all that young grey cortical matter is being scalded and defoliated by a kind of cognitive agent orange, depriving them of moral agency, imagination and awareness of consequences, which is what I was talking about. The substitution of virtual experience for real life encounters, the impact of spoon fed menu options as opposed to free ranging inquiry, you know, a decline in linguistic and visual imagination, yo bro, uh, an atrophy of creativity, contracted brutalized text messages, lacking the verbs and conditional structures essential for com complex thinking. Computer games are emphasizing process over content, method over meaning and mental activity. And this is worrying. This is worrying, because as I explained, the consequ consequences that we are seeing in a few short years is, is brutalizing. But we do not want to lose the internet. We do not want to lose Facebook. So, how do we balance the gifts of both? And in that context, you know, and in the context of what we as neuroscientists have learnt about art, you know, art education utilization of art and the the, the 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 word is consilience of using science to 
to investigate art and using art to inform science, I think is a, is a, is a, is a way forward that we need to examine. Far too long, these have been seen as you know two different rooms and nobody from this room will come to that room and nobody from that room will go into that room. And we now understand that as far as the human brain is concerned, art is science and science is art. Thank you. So, if we agree to the theory that butterfly is able to understand the beauty in a flower and then of course, they have to do something like that or if a bower is making its nest beautiful first nest to come and then certify it, mm. then they do not have that, that much. I mean, we also see uh, find the flower to be beautiful, is not it? Mm. Two things like one is, is there a neural uh, footprint of what the butterfly has in ours? And then okay. And the other thing is like they do not have that much big the brain and volume as we have. Yeah, it is it's not the question of big brain, I mean, I mean since you brought, brought up big brain, uh, women have smaller brains than men do, but uh, it is now accepted as of two weeks back that they are more efficient brains, because all the, the non-essential parts have been um, trimmed and it is about trimming in the human brain, but that is a different question. The question that you asked is are the butterflies processes uh, you know part of our processes and the answer is yes you know through the last two uh, days i've been asserting that nature is a very stingy uh, processor of things evolution uses the same processes ad nauseum over and over again it doesn't make new processes so the same genes which are used for color perception have been retained through you know the higher the so called higher evolved uh, animals. But having said that the bower bird or the butterfly actually makes art for art sake for enjoyment they do it for a particular purpose they do it for the purpose of looking for nutrition finding nutrition or ensuring genetic survival. We are the only species you know, which actually creates a work of art and says, hey come watch it. You know, and I get nothing out of it other than the fact that you say, ah, wow, wow, beautiful. You know, nowadays of course, I get a little bit of cash, but most of art was created, the, pay, the caves of Lascaux were not created to, to sell at uh, you know, Sotheby's uh, auction. They were made because somebody just wanted to represent you know mammoths woolly mammoths uh, running you know the people who made the chola bronzes made it because they were enamored by the beauty of women you know or vice versa but uh, so in that sense art is slightly different because most of art is in the, if, if in the, in the strict evolutionary sense is non functional what do you do with it you can't eat it. I don't know whether I have answered your questions. No, it was a non-technical answer. It was a more emotional answer. Now, when you come to children, okay, so they see a visual stimulus. Let it be a picture or whatever. And then, if you ask them to draw again, the same thing. They come up with a very what is a their own representation. Absolutely. Of it, which is, I mean, which explains the rasa, as you said, the, the, the abstract level of. Correct. So, then like would you say that this one is the, is the way that information is stored up? No. What I was saying was that in, uh, uh, children process the information differently from adults and that is because they see it in parts whereas, we learn to put everything together and make a three dimensional representation because we are using these things and having used it for a very long time we have refined the process. It is very simple. If a child is asked to kick a ball, the child has to decide that I am standing here and then has to kick the ball. You know, three times out of four, the child is going to fall, is going to miss the ball, and <coughs> but then he or she will manage to do it after having put all these things together. You do not even have to think twice, right? Because the same processes you are doing, but in your brain, they have got by doing it so many times, they have got uh, it has become an algorithm where you do not have to go through the to all the component processes.
does the act of perception for art depends upon the prior knowledge from person to person? Absolutely. That is you know some of the slides that I was showing showed that if you are aware of the value of that, your perception of that object changes. Which is why some people are able to sell shit for whatever uh, <laughs> amount of money. And I mean it both in the figurative and the real <laughs> sense. No, no, no. I did not say development of imagination does not have. Uh, I said there are stages. So, there are stages where there is pretend play. Pretend play does not happen in um, if you take a one year old, take two one year one year olds okay, and put them together, they will never play with each other. This one will go playing his or her one, one and a half years old will play with his or her toys, that one will play with his or her toys. It is almost as if the other one did not exist. When you become two or three, you start saying give me yours, give, give me yours. Then when you are four or five, you actually engage together to do pretend play. Let us play house house or whatever. Yeah. So, it goes through stages and these stages are dependent on brain maturity. And some kids cannot do that, because their brain does not mature. For example, autistic kids can never play with another uh, child. They would rather play with their mechanical toy and they will do it very well. They will uh, you know give them a Lego set, they will do all kinds of things, much better than the other kids. But person to person, imagination not there. So, I would like to ask two questions. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We will pause for a short one. Whichever way you want. Uh, firstly, uh, does neuroscience think of consciousness as a priority, something that is above and beyond the brain? And secondly, how does the mind distinguish between good, bad, and like, dislike? We have very difficult questions. Let me tackle your first one, uh, your your second one first. How does the mind distinguish between good and bad? The mind doesn't distinguish between good and bad. The mind is taught good and bad by environmental circumstances. But having been taught that, we have error detectors which tell us is this the direction I want to go in. You know, If I step like this, will I manage to cross the wire or would not I manage to cross the wire. You know, If I pick up this thing, will he get upset with me or would not he get upset with me. You know, And we have processes in the brain which do that. We have processes in the brain which act as breaks, okay, which is one part of the brain which grows later. So, a younger person does not have the capacity to restrict himself or herself. A small child will go and pick it up without thinking that should I ask or, or should not I ask. Uh, uh, an adolescent is more likely to do something impulsively without thinking of the consequences than an adult is because an adolescent lacks that part of the brain, I mean in full maturity, which are the breaks of the brain, which says hang on, wait, think and then do. So, there are processes for that, but as to whether something is good, essential, the, the value judgments, these are things human beings have learnt over time. You know, for example, is killing people good or bad? You know? Is a, is, a, is a difficult question, because we are all taught killing is bad, but then we will be the first one to say hang x y z and that is good, because it you know you are you are acting on behalf of the larger mob. You know, so, so these, these are slightly difficult questions and these are uh, these are shaped by our social circumstances, shaped by our education. If you are in, in the south of the USA, hanging is good. But if you are in New York state, you would go out on parade saying hanging is bad. So, I do not know, but does that answer your second question? What the first one was? Uh, does neuroscience think of consciousness as <sighs> This is a, is, a, is a whole talk by itself. Uh, it is actually 
20 talks by uh, itself. Now, by that I understand you to mean that that consciousness has to exist before anything else exists, yes. okay. which means a sense of self has to exist before anything else exists. I am therefore, I think. Okay. Now, this actually comes from a much earlier understanding, which is this whole mind body dichotomy, that the mind is somehow different from the brain, is not it. What we are more and more realizing is that the mind is actually created because of crosstalk of different neurons in the brain. And yet, if I say this, I will be guilty of uh, oversimplification, reductio ad absurdum, because it cannot be just that. However, once you kill the brain, when brain activity stops, there is no mind. So, the truth lies somewhere in between. I am afraid I am not competent to answer that question, uh, because as neuroscientists, which we, we, we really do not know, but more and more the evidence points to the fact that you know between the these circuits, the, the positive and the negative doing circuits, somewhere the mind is constructed, but the mind is also constructed out of what we have learned, out of what many generations have learnt and put together, you know the, the, these whole cultural memes, etcetera a difficult question to answer. Um, can aesthetic be generalized? Can something be built which everybody thinks looks nice? What do you think? No. Yeah, I, I tend to agree that you know there are some things that you will react to. Human brains will always react to missing information. Like I showed those dapper things you will always look at something as, but aesthetics also has a major cultural component to it. That there are certain things you like, because you have been taught to like it, you have been taught to value it, you know, like sitar music. So, again the answer lies somewhere in between. And uh, as a neuroscientist, I have learnt you know to stay in the equator never stay either on the north pole or the south pole you know so yeah so slightly out of subject sir. so when we are imaging any conditions so in the fmri sir, sir uh, we managed to uh, put one condition at a time sir. so sir when we are trying to image the influence of music on a mind sir, so how close are we uh, to mapping that particular condition because multiple conditions cannot be taken at a time in the fmri which is one of the issues in the fmri which is a problem, you know. Uh, you can't really have very complex uh, phenomenon and say that you know we are responding to this. Which is why I was laughing at this whole thing of this neuro cinema. You're showing people cinema. You don't know what people are reacting to. You know, are they reacting to the music? Are they reacting to the editing, etc. But it's slightly easier when you are playing one snatch of music and you're showing uh, response to that. And yet, you can never be sanguine that this is the exact reaction to this. So, often you know when we talk about this as scientists, we say this perhaps may be related to this, may be associated with that. Right now, there are no causal explanations. What is there are associative or associated observations this is associated with this. 9 times out of 10, this is the association uh, of brain activity uh, that is associated with listening to this particular thing. Okay. So, I cannot make assertions, I can make suggestions. Sir, I was uh, sir, just asking sir, that uh, sir, you must uh, uh, sir, have uh, observed uh, many experiments. In those experiments, sir, uh, how consistent, uh, sir, are these? So, if, if we take ten subjects, 
at a time or say uh, 20 random samples at a time and uh, play a music so uh, during those conditions how close are those subjects so uh, showing similar activities similar neuronal activities uh, when they are imaged so they are because see <coughs> what you do is you create conditions where one group of people are given a particular condition another group of people are not given a particular condition or given a uh, a, a placebo condition okay so somebody is given uh, say music another person is given some sort of white noise you know you don't create a condition where somebody just sits in the you know lies there and and daydreams somebody has to be listening so you create as as comparable a condition as possible. You can always knock holes in my uh, experimental condition, but we will have to create better and better conditions. Remember that these the some of the data that I presented are things which are being done for the first time. It is a brave new world you know and you know the last thing that I told you guys was that art and science have to talk to each other otherwise this is not going to happen. Uh, and now, art and science has started talking to each other, but our languages are so different. Uh, but you know, somewhere you have to start. And I, I totally agree with you that the, the conditions that you create to study these have to be refined more and more and more. Sir, sir how poor, uh, sir, uh, sir, where does belief, sir, has to influence everything? What do you mean? Sir, sir, any belief, sir, uh, how is belief going to influence anything, sir? Uh, if you are taking any condition at that time, sir, see music, mm. in it, uh, how, how deep is the core of belief in that? Which By belief, belief, what do you mean? Be, you are talking of faith? Sir, uh, yeah. belief, any sort of belief, sir. Belief uh, that, uh, sir, e even we come through a culture where we are made to believe that uh, a music uh, can make us feel better. better. So, this is a belief, sir. How, how is belief that? belief part is going to influence. Uh, it does, it does. No, I showed you evidence which says that you know if something is shown to be valuable, mm -hmm. your response changes and if something is shown to be non-valuable, mm -hmm. your response changes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are going to get in belief, faith, religion, etcetera, these are complicated subjects you know and uh, we are no longer, we are, we are no, not, not there yet. These are, these are valid subjects for enquiry. But these are so complicated because there are so many multiple uh, elements there. We are no longer. We are just at this stage of very simple enquiry here. Yeah. You're right. These questions need to be asked. But I don't think we still have the tools to answer them. Thank you. you should think up. Uh, you know how to ask these questions. I'm a student. You are. So, you should ask these questions. I will learn from art students. <laughs> no, no, you will, have, you will have to create the conditions. But you are, you are absolutely right. You were saying something. Yeah. Uh, with this uh, <coughs> art and science is like talking to each other, coming together, uh, what I feel, I could be wrong, <coughs> we are mostly looking at the science of art rather than the art of science. And is it not that the science of art is actually taking away the artistic side of arts as he said that is there something that can generally appeal to everyone. So, you are trying to create more professional kind of things and that aesthetic. And why is that not artistic? Because it is basically more uh, say professional oriented or materialistic kind of thing. So, you are not just creating art for the sake of uh, arts, you are doing it because you want to sell it to a larger audience. And it can, uh, through the media and all, it can also be used not only for selling your stuff uh, for money, but also for you know propaganda and many other. And things. art for art's sake doesn't sell itself for money. Mm, not necessarily. I uh, could. It could sell, but uh, that is not my primary intention. Mm -hmm. I, it is your primary intention. I mean, today when somebody creates a painting, they don't create it to hide it in their room. Very few people do. Yeah, but they do. Some people do. They well, have. some people do. Most people who do science do it just for the uh, joy of learning. See, I uh, get a little concerned when one makes this whole uh, this distinction. Again, you're creating two rooms. 
that the artists do it for pure love and uh, happiness and the scientists have got a, uh, what is the word you used, a materialistic bent and they want to find okay. bricks and mortar. You know, that is the very, uh, the very cold water on the dialogue that we are trying to create. You know, that is the, uh, that is the, the older way of thinking. What we should actually be thinking is that can we help each other understand each other. There is no shame in saying that look, like I said, how can I be bored in a better way? How can we be creative in a better way? If I have the way of learning how to be happier and it has come through scientific knowledge, would you throw it away? saying that it is a materialistic way of getting happier. You know, this is a philosophical uh, discussion that we are having, but it is this whole schism between North Pole art and South Pole science, which I do not think is helpful any longer today. We need to come, as I said, to the equator, where you know there was a there was this writer called Edmund Wilson, I do not know whether you guys have read him. He, he created this word called consilience, where one discipline merges with the other discipline and becomes stronger for it, both, both become stronger for it. And that is something that has to happen. Uh, maybe I will just put my question in a different way. Uh, we are trying to understand art through the mirror of science. Is it to improve art? or to increase its marketability? It is to improve your understanding. It does not need to lead to something. It needs to lead to knowledge. Why can't it just need to knowledge, uh, to lead to increase knowledge? Sir, so, so with your permission, can I add, add something? Sure, sure, please. Sir, uh, sir, uh, Sir, knowing the sir, molecular constituent of anything does not uh, sir, take away the subjective experience of anything. Sir, if we know uh, the molecular constituent of sugar, know where, know where it takes away that the sugar is it's sweet, sweet sir, when you are having it. So, sir, very similar, uh, I think, uh, uh, sir, this gap, uh, the gap that is created in art and science. And in India, I have always found this that uh, the students, <coughs> our students are groomed in a way in which they have. Uh, their cre uh, uh, sense of anti -science, uh, science is created in them, and they are always uh, groomed in a way in which they uh, sir, come out and attack science that uh, science is too materialistic, sir. And I just simply want to add that uh, if we know the mechanism of anything, no way it takes away the subjective experience of anything. So, so anything, sir. and uh, the uh, art is a subjective experience, and uh, right now whatever you explained, so. Uh, Sir, it speaks of the mechanism how uh, the subjective experience are working in the human body, sir. So that no way takes up from us, sir, how it should be. So uh, what is the subjective experience of art? And uh, this has nothing to do with demeaning art or sir, being dismissive of poetry, literature. Okay. Okay. How would you react to that? <laughs> I mean, basically, that's a totally different dimension. Again, I am not opposed to uh, trying to understand the process. I am just a bit worried about, for example, that you mentioned neuro cinema. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it that you actually knew neuro, neuro cinema or for that matter neuro marketing? Why do you want to understand all that? What is the ultimate use that it is going to be put to? So, I am basically worried about that. Yeah, but then see that is depends on how you use a particular invention, you know. Now, you can use dynamite for various things. You do not necessarily have to put it. Uh, uh, into a waistcoat and burn, you know burst, uh, you know cre kill kill people. You can use it for other things. You can use space travel for uh, a particular thing. You can use it to to shower rockets on on your on, on your enemy. So why something is used and the potential for harm for anything is something peculiar to human beings. That human beings will find harmful uses for anything. So, but that does not necessarily mean that one should stay in a cave and not venture out and see the world and, and create things and find uh, uh, you know new, 
knowledge. So, that is a Luddite argument, is not it? That one should not have more knowledge, because it can always be used uh, to, to, to destroy. You are not happy with that. <laughs> You can have at max one more person, not more than that. Yeah. Sir, in those brain images, right? How do we interpret those images? There is more act, more activity in one region, and that region is what? That region is a dedicated region of the brain. No. It is not a localized area, right? It is localized, but it's no, there are no dedicated regions in the brain. Ah. But there are regions which we know subserve certain uh, functions, but the brain keeps talking to each other. I mean, uh, the, the areas of the brain keep talking to each other. So, uh, now we know, I mean, and this, these are earlier studies. Okay, earlier studies looked at, uh, with this fMRI, they looked at areas where there was increased activity, increased utilization of oxygen in the brain. So, you assume that there is increased activity, because more oxygen is being burnt. But now, what we are, the areas that we are moving into, obviously none of the, those uh, things are here, is you are now looking at circuits, areas that fire together, work together. You know, and that is very interesting, uh, but it is in its infancy. So, people are now looking at circuits. For example, this uh, resting state potential, I showed you a picture, I did not elaborate, but people, areas which rest together are probably talking to each other, are gossiping with each other. And areas which get activated together, they are also circuits. So, we are now able to see which circuits get activated, when you know certain things are done. And that does not mean that that circuit is dedicated to that. No, 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 it is not dedicated. dedicated. As I said, the brain is very, very, I mean the you know nature is very stingy. It does not have different circuits for different things. It uses the same thing for different uh, purposes. You know, this whole, that, that was this whole uh, earlier thing, uh, where you felt this part is for this, that part is for that, you used to do mapping uh, of the bumps on your uh, on your skull. No, no, no. Now, it is far more complicated than that, and far more economical than that. <laughs>